Hi guys, so I wanted to make yet another video for you uh, since we didn't finish our uh, lesson today in class. Um, any case, I'll pick up right here before example three. We finished example two together. Remember the AP exam tip, you must describe randomization that you are doing in your exper experimental design. A picture alone is not enough. Uh, and then it says here, uh, control group. So primary purpose of a control group is to provide a baseline. So comparison is a huge uh, fact uh, feature of um, designing experiments. So actually we can classify our experimental design as a randomized comparative experiment okay Ran randomized comparative experiment so uh, randomization must be there experiment implies treatment imposed and comparison means uh, that I have at least two groups in my experiment uh, sometimes we have more okay uh, so uh, then it says you can have uh, experiments where this says that you can have experiments where um, you only have two groups. I think I said this in class. And, you know, you could be comparing the effectiveness of two medicines or something like that without a control group. If you can have a control group, always good. But it is possible to do an experiment without a control group. All right. Um, so also the other thing I think, uh, if I just go back here. So we drew little boxes around this in our... Uh, experimental design uh, I think that you also have to understand one thing is that having two groups really allows us to uh, control for confounding so the question is uh, are there factors in this group here or this group here that are in other than the online format of the SAT prep class or the regular classroom setting of the SAT prep class are there other factors that might be impacting students' SAT scores? The answer is yes. There might be other factors, but um, because of random assignment, what we really have done is created two groups that are roughly equivalent. Now, they may not be exactly the same, but they may, they're may they as good as we can get because random assignment determined the groups. So in that case, if there's confounding going on in this group, there's also confounding going on in this group. I have no reason to believe that the confounding going on in each group is different. But the only difference between the two groups is that one got the online treatment and one got the classroom treatment, or we could call that the control group. And therefore, we still know that when we compare SAT scores, that if one group is higher than the other, or lower than the other, that our results are actually valid. Okay? So confounding is still taking place, but it's taking place in both groups and we think about equally, and therefore we are controlling for confounding with our experimental design. Very, very important uh, principle to understand. So uh, example three, I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read the whole thing with you. Um, you can pause the video, read it, and then do it on your note sheet if you want, and then pick up afterwards. But uh, I'll just show you how this uh, ends up working. You say, I've got 29 students that are volunteers. Um, then we do random assignment. And I, th yeah, I guess I can do it this way. Random assignment. Okay. And then I have two groups. We can call this uh, group one. I better write group one and that would have let's say 15 students and then this could be my group two and if there's 29 students that would have to be uh, the remaining 14 students okay so 14 students and then uh, this would be uh, the treatment group, this would be the treatment group, and this would be the control. 
And what treatment does the treatment group get? And so it said um, 15 students to the treatment uh, uh, videotape a practice performance, ask a student to evaluate, and then have student discuss tape with a small group. So we can call this treatment uh, small group discussion in addition to the rest of it. And then uh, the group of 14 students, uh, they watch and evaluate their tapes alone. So they do the same thing except that they're doing the evaluation alone. So uh, just say evaluate hello and then at the end please don't just say compare results but we say compare evaluations uh, and maybe we can even be more specific uh, of performance okay something like that so you, you must use context Com not compare results, compare evaluations of performance. All of this has a lot of context in it. You must use context, okay? And then we said that um, you must describe your random assignment in order to get credit for something like this on an AP exam. Of course, forget the AP exam, you should be doing this in any case, okay? And so we can say, uh, we can generate an alphabetical list Okay, of students uh, and assign them numbers zero, one to twenty nine. Okay, and then we want to select fifteen for the one group, fourteen for the other. So you can say we can use. Um, use technology to randomly select 15 students without replacement um, to receive to receive uh, the treatment. I guess technically there are, uh, yeah, to receive the treatment, okay? The treatment, all right? Uh, and then the rest of the students will be the control group. Okay, uh, and then what's the purpose of the control group in this experiment? Uh, to allow for comparison, okay? To allow for comparison. Uh, between small group and individual evaluation. Otherwise, I just get a bunch of evaluations and I have nothing to compare them to. So that does not really help us. If I just did this with no control, then I'd get evaluations, but are they higher than they would have been otherwise? Who knows? Okay, so it's kind of hard to evaluate the effectiveness of small group discussion then. Okay, um, so that's that. So uh, principles of experimental design, let's talk about this. Um, control, uh, random assignment, replication. Okay, so I said this already a little bit. Uh, control in an experiment here uh, for us means for sure use a comparative design. In other words, the two groups that we have, and I can compare the two groups to each other. That's the comparative design. Uh, 
and ensure, <laughs> there goes my iPad, great, and ensure that the only systematic difference between the groups is the treatment administered. So these groups should, we should try and make them roughly equivalent, almost exactly the same except for the treatment. Now that actually involves a lot more than just making a comparative and doing random assignment. That re means that you have to actively design your experiment so that the conditions for both groups are virtually identical. Okay, uh, and then random assignment, of course, use chance to assign experiment, experimental units to treatments. This helps create roughly equivalent groups. That's what we want, that's what we want. Okay, very important. Um, and then replication, just meaning use enough experimental units. This is not replication as you learn in science that your uh, results are reproducible. That's not really what this means. But of course, in practice, uh, statisticians would also want that to be the case. But in this case, we mean have enough subjects or experimental units uh, so that you know that what happened is not just due to chance variation in your experiment. Okay, so here it says replication means use enough subjects. So example four, there's a long blurb here you can read. This is a real thing out of Harvard, okay? The physician's health study, they're already like in the third or fourth phase of this thing or second or third phase of the physician's health study. I'll let you read that. Read that very carefully. See if you understand what's going on there. Um, and then I will just answer um, the question here for you, okay? So you can pause the video, read that, think about it, see if you understand it. And then here's, here's the solution to it, all right? So three principles. So what are the three principles? Control, random assignment, replication. So explain how those were used in this study. So let's talk about control, okay? Control here is um, the experiment, the experiment used groups that allowed for comparison. Uh, okay, allowed for comparison between groups taking medicine and placebo and by having similar conditions, okay? Comparison between groups taking the medicine and placebo. And if you read this carefully, you read that some people were taking two medicines, some were taking one medicine and placebo, two placebos or placebo and beta carotene. So, and one medicine. So that's pretty complicated how that was done. Any case, so the experiment used uh, groups that allowed for comparison between groups taking the medicine and placebo. Um, and the other form of control was uh, by having similar by having similar uh, experimental conditions. This is super, super important and difficult to do, okay? Uh, in this case, that refers to the schedules. Schedules of taking medicine. Okay, so, if you read that, then this makes sense to you. Uh, and then random assignment. All right, so we also know that random assignment was used to form the four groups. Um, so we can assume they were roughly equivalent, okay? They were roughly 
equivalent at the start of the study. Okay, so random assignment happened. Okay, and then finally, uh, uh, replication was ensured by using more than 5,000 subjects per treatment group. That is highly, highly unusual. That is a ton of subjects, okay, in experiment. All right. So those are how the three principles were at play here, okay? Uh, and then what can go wrong? All right, what can go wrong? The placebo effect, this kind of uh, jarringly crazy what happens with placebo effect sometimes. So... Um, the response to a dummy treatment is called the placebo effect. If some subjects do not take any pills, the effect of aspirin or beta carotene would be confounded with the placebo effect. The effect of simply taking pills. Okay. Um, so some people take dummy pills, but because they're taking pills, they believe that they should have some kind of a response and therefore they actually somehow do have a response. Uh, just like their mind playing a trick on them or something. It's really, really strange. And it happens to, we have to assume it's happening to everybody when they take a placebo. So placebo effect is something that's very difficult to understand, but we have to control for it by having the com comparative groups, the comparative design, uh, this design right here controls even for the placebo effect because if it's a if the study is about medicine and we have two groups taking medicine well both of them are suffering from placebo effect okay so then again the comparison allows us to control for the placebo effect um, in this case here's our four groups all four of these groups of people would be experiencing placebo effect because they're all taking tablets okay um, whether they're getting the uh, active ingredient or not. So, uh, yeah, you can read this. They give all kinds of ex uh, examples here of placebo effect. I will, uh, again, email you the article, and it's also on Schoology about placebos and some of the stunning findings they have about placebo effect, okay? Uh, very, very interesting. Um, and very important for you to know that's this is a huge reason why we need a comparative experimental design okay so uh, uh, mm, mm, mm. okay uh, so here it says it's also foolish to tell doctors and other medical personnel what treatment each subject received if they know what subject, what that a subject is getting just a placebo, they may expect less than if they know the subject is receiving promising experimental drug. Okay. Uh, and here it says, because the placebo effect is so strong, it would be foolish to tell subjects if they're receiving a new drug or a placebo, knowing that they're getting just a placebo might weaken the placebo effect. In other words, if I know I'm not taking medicine, I might not suffer from placebo effect as much or at all. Um, so we don't want to kind of uh, mess with the results of the experiment by telling people what they're receiving. You want them to just be in the dark as to what they're receiving. And if there's placebo effect, everybody has placebo effect the same way. Okay. Um, and so uh, whenever possible, experiments with human subjects should be double blind. That's the best. That's the ideal. And so what does double blind mean? It says here in a double blind experiment. Neither subjects nor those who interact with them measure the response variable uh, uh, know which treatment the subject received. Uh, for some reason, this really bothers stu some students and they can't figure this out. Uh, I can't figure out why some people can't figure this out. <laughs> it's not really that complicated. Um, all it says is double blind means the person receiving the drug doesn't know what 
drug they're receiving, or, or sorry, the person receiving the tablet, let's say we go back here, uh, this group receiving these tablets, they don't know that these tablets are placebos, okay? They don't know if they have the drug in them or if they have uh, nothing in them, they just get tablets. But this group here, who's receiving both tablets with medicine, they don't know what they're receiving either. They're just being told, here's some medicine. Now, that's single blind. If the person taking the medicine or the tablet doesn't know what it is, medicine or placebo, that's single blind. The person giving, here's the person, here's my representation of the person administering the drug. If they don't know what the person, uh, what they're giving the subject in the experiment, then, then it's double blind, okay, if both of those things are true. So if this person doesn't know what he's administering to the subject, and this person who's the subject doesn't know what he's taking, uh, that would call, be called double blind, okay? Both of them are blind to what they're taking. They're blind to the truth. Uh, likewise, same thing here. If this person doesn't know and this person doesn't know, now that doesn't mean no one knows. Please don't get confused with that. The person running the drug trial or the experiment or the statistician or someone, they would know exactly who's receiving what. But they don't have to tell the person delivering the drug to the or, or the tablets to the patient or mailing the tablets to the patient. They don't have to tell him what it is. They just tell him, mail this package to this person. Okay, And this person does it and this person takes it, but they don't know what they're taking. Okay, That's double blind. It's not really that complicated. If only one party doesn't know what's going on, then we call it single blind. Okay, um, And so double blind uh, is the best type of situation. Okay, um, Because this means no one's perceptions or ideas or anything is, uh, could potentially bias the results or affect the results. That's the whole point of double blind. Okay, uh, the idea of double blind is simple. Uh -huh -huh -huh. Until the experiment ends, the results are in. Only the statistician knows, or the, you know, whoever, the person designing the study, or whoever. Usually, the statistician. Uh, and then, however, some experiments cannot be double blind. Okay, uh, and so they give you some examples here. If researchers are comparing the effect of exercise and dieting on weight loss then subjects will know which treatment they are receiving if they are exercising, okay? If I'm exercising, I'm not confused about whether I am trying to lose weight. Uh, I know I'm part of the group trying to lose weight by exercising, and then another group that's exercising and dieting, and another group that's just dieting, okay? I would know that I'm doing something uh, that you can't hide from me, all right? Um, so if an experiment can only be uh, conducted in a way that one person is blind to what's going on, okay? So the single blind part comes from the people who are interacting with the subjects and measuring their response, All right? Um, and then, yeah, you can read that. That's fine. I think I said enough about that. Uh, so let's read this. You can read that, pause the video, read that blurb, example five, and then I'll go in and uh, actually do the, uh, fill in the examples with you. So, did the experimental design take placebo effect into account? Uh, and says, we say no. Uh, the woman, the woman who knew they did not receive an ultrasound. Uh, did not suffer from placebo effect. Okay. Uh, and the experimental group did, all right? And the uh, experimental group did, or the treatment group did. I shouldn't say experimental group. 
Uh, the treatment group did. Okay, so I can't suffer from placebo effect if I'm not being, my mind's not being tricked into thinking something's happening to me. I'm not taking a caplet, I'm not, or a tablet, I'm not getting a fake ultrasound, something like that. All right, uh, what's the experiment? Double blind, no. Uh, the mothers who did not receive an ultrasound new. They did not receive an ultrasound. <laughs> okay. Um, and then finally, describe an improved design. So describe an improved design. Okay. Uh, so, think about this carefully. I have my volunteers. I do a random assignment. Actually, I'm deviating from our pattern here. Uh, we do random assignment. Okay. Uh, and then We do random assignment to treatments, and we have here uh, the, we can say the uh, treatment group, uh, which gets the working ultrasound, and then we have the control group but they would get a dummy ultrasound. Okay, and then um, we will, in the end, uh, compare results. And what are we trying to do? Uh, birth weights, okay? So we want to compare birth weights. Uh, this would be better. This would be better. So a working ultrasound, and then what would this be? A dummy ultrasound. You could have an ultrasound that has a pre-recorded scan on it on the screen, so it looks like it's working, makes the sound, feels the same, still put the lotion on the tummy, all that kind of stuff, um, but uh, nothing happens. Okay, it's not actually real. It's fake. So that the two groups are both experiencing placebo effect, there's room for comparison, everybody thinks everything is the same. And you could possibly also do that in a double blind manner where uh, you know only the statistician knows who is receiving the actual ultrasound and who's receiving the fake dummy ultrasound. All right guys, I hope that helped.